Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another week of The Giver Podcast. I am Melissa Valliere. If you guys don't know, I'm sure you do. But we're back again for another week. It's the second episode of the new year. And last week's episode was the meat of it was recorded in the fall of last year. And the intro was recorded last week. And the intro was pretty heavy. I feel like I had a lot of emotional weight. I still do, but it's getting lighter coming into this new year. I'm sure you guys could tell by my energy and how I was speaking and things like that. And I kind of gave a little bit of insight into what was going on, but I'm here again solo this week and I kind of wanted to take this chance to dive a little bit deeper into what's been going on with me. And I've had a lot of let's call them learnings or realizations in the last couple weeks. It's crazy that it's 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 only the middle of January. I feel like I've lived like three lives in the last three weeks, four weeks, but I've had two sessions with Jordan, actually, my therapist this month so far. And something that we talked about was the power in sharing. And again, it's really tricky when the wound is still open to kind of share and put yourself out there because you don't want to, when you're vulnerable, it's and like you're in the process of working through something, you almost want to keep it close to you and your support system, which honestly, when I'm feeling like really, really unsafe and like I feel like I'm really struggling, that is Ian and that's it, which is okay. I'm so lucky to even have him as someone that I can lean on and lean into when I need him. But I do think that there's a lot of power in sharing, not only for me, but for everybody else. I was even talking to Ian. We went snowboarding on Wednesday and we were sitting in the lodge in between. Like we, like we were there for four hours. We took a break and had lunch. We were talking and he was he had met a guy at the gym who was talking to him about how he had transformed his life and he had gone through a divorce and he had really kind of started off the healing process being really angry and being really resentful to his ex-wife and as he started to kind of look inward and take accountability that started to go away and it started to become less anger and more opportunity to become who he wants to be and Ian's actually going on his podcast because because he looked at Ian and he was like, it's so interesting because it's probably really easy for everyone to look at you and be like, wow, your life must be so perfect. You get to work out for a living. You have a wife. You have a nice house. You have dogs. Like you don't really have to go to work every day and you get to do what you love and make money. And it's really easy to just see that and to think like, oh, they must have it all together. When in reality, we both have a lot of struggles internally, mental health issues, self-worth issues, imposter syndrome self-doubt, relationship issues, family issues. I think that's just part of the human experience. I think making mistakes is part of being a human. I think not showing up how you want to every time is part of being human. Yeah, I really just want to take today and kind of without getting too specific, because obviously when you get into like micro details, it starts to be too personal. And I don't want to share other people's stories or opportunities that they're working on. I just want to share mine. I don't know if you can tell, but I feel a lot lighter this week than I did last week. I just actually finished a meditation and that's probably the seventh meditation I've done in my entire life all being within the last three weeks. And it's always been something that's been very intimidating to me. And now that I'm doing it, it's kind of ironic that it's this thing that people talk about that seems so unattainable but really all you have to do is be and as I was meditating tonight I was lying there and I do guided meditations I use Melissa Wood I think her her app is called Melissa Wood Health and I was lying there and I was thinking and you're 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 just kind of letting your thoughts come and go and I actually kind of picture waves while I'm meditating kind of like coming and going just like my breath like in inhaling and exhaling and I was like this is something that seemed so impossible to me 
And so I could I couldn't do that. I couldn't sit still for 12 minutes and meditate. And it's kind of sad that there's this thing that's so it's truly accessible to everybody. That's the point of it. But it feels so unattainable. And listen, some days are easier than others. Some days I don't even do it. My goal is to meditate once a day, obviously, at seven times in the last three weeks that hasn't been happening. And some days I sit there and I'm like, the time is passing so slow. What is going on? And then other times it's the time just goes and I come back, come out of it and I feel so much better. But the point is just doing it. Anyone who wants to try it, just try it because it's so much less intimidating than it seems from the outside. Let's get into it. I don't know how many of you are like diehards who listen to every single episode, who have been following kind of what's been going on. We started this podcast, I mean, it must be close to a year ago now, maybe half a year. Uh, We started later last year, and I actually started the beginning of 2023 planning on doing bodybuilding shows. I used to compete in figure. I was an IFBB pro, so my plan for 2023 was to come back to the stage, do... I wanted to do four or five shows. I wanted to win. I wanted to go to the Olympia. And then I kind of wanted to retire after that. I wanted to have one last go at it and then retire and then start focusing on the next chapter in my life, which would be becoming a mom, becoming a businesswoman, things like that. But I wanted to give myself what I thought I needed, which was one more push towards a goal that was so important to me at one point in my life. As time was progressing, I started prep and I started dieting and I started doing cardio and I started doing all these things. And four weeks went by and Ian, my husband, is also my coach. So he kind of, well, first he kind of hinged at the fact that he actually did not want to coach me into my shows last year. He was, he has stepped away from coaching and wanted to focus more on his career. So he kind of hinted at that. I said, absolutely not. I'm not letting anyone else coach me. I'll coach myself. And he was like, okay, we'll do it together, which probably is one early sign that I wasn't super committed to this because I didn't want to have an investment. I didn't want to waste somebody else's time. I didn't want to commit like that, to be completely honest. I wasn't there consciously yet. I was still consciously thinking that this was what my year was going to be and this is what I wanted to do. So we started prep. I think it was like January, mid-January, and we kind of ramped things up. I always start every... I'm not... I was not a natural competitor. I used PEDs, but I always started every prep natural. I did about four to six weeks always of just cleaning up the diet, um, upping the cardio, training intensity, and kind of let my body adjust before adding in PEDs. So we started that. And as time is progressing, things are moving along. The show date's coming closer. Ian's like, okay, we need to start discussing like what we're going to introduce, what we're going to do this year. And I was like, oh, no, not yet. I need to do blood work. Oh, no, not yet. I have an appointment. I made an appointment with the fertility center because I want to see if I am still healthy fertility wise and if I even want to compete this year, because if I'm not healthy fertility wise, then we need to start figuring this out now. I was 32 at the time. We're 33 now. So I kept pushing it. I kept pushing it. And we did all the fertility testing I was told everything was fine. My hormones were normal. I was ovulating as normal. I had a normal follicle count for a woman of my age. I asked the doctor that with this follicle count, if I'm not planning on trying to conceive this year, should I think about freezing? And she said, absolutely not. If you're planning on trying within the next couple of years, that's fine. If not, I would start thinking about freezing, but we, it was always going to be us trying for a baby in 2024. So everything came back green and we were starting to be like okay like next stage in prep like let's start the stack let's start to figure out what we're gonna do and I started not being able to sleep I started having a lot of anxiety about putting these things into my body about doing such extreme training about like the muscularity I don't know I just had a lot of anxiety and I woke up one morning and I kind of tried to sit with my thoughts and I hadn't been sleeping for a couple nights which is very abnormal for me and I decided that competing as a bodybuilder at that level was no longer in alignment with my goals and who I wanted to be 
So I decided to retire and let go of that side, that part of my life. So that happened. After that happened, I decided to take out my IUD. And at that point, we weren't trying, but we weren't not trying. My husband, Ian, is also a competitive bodybuilder and he was getting ready for a show. So the likelihood of getting pregnant was very low anyways. We didn't worry about it. But as as time went on, I started to kind of warm up to the idea of having a baby. I started to think like, oh, what are we waiting for? Like, let's just do it. If we can have a baby while he's still competing, what's the big deal? Now, within that time, I had gone, I had decided that my next chapter was going to like fitness wise was going to be to lose some muscle and become a skinnier less muscular girl that's just what I wanted I still love muscular women I love women of all shapes of all sizes but for me I just wanted to downsize a little bit so this started pretty healthily I I, I I actually was still weight training at the beginning and Ian kind of said after a few weeks, he's like, I don't know if any resistance training is going to be conducive to you losing the muscle. So I stopped resistance training completely and I started just doing very low impact cardio. I walked on the treadmill for about 45 to 60 minutes a day and I would walk the dogs outside. As I started, this is so hard to talk about. As I started seeing results, I started losing weight really quickly. I started to get really skinny. I had, I got a lot of positive attention. A lot of people telling me how good I looked. I felt so good. My clothes were fitting fabulously. I started to fall into a little, no, I started to uh, fall into a pattern of disordered eating. So I was under eating and I was over exercising and I probably was doing about two hours of cardio a day and now I'm still walking on the treadmill but I'm walking at a four and a half mile pace at an incline. I'm also getting in about 20,000 steps a day not on top of the cardio that's including the cardio so I'm getting 20,000 steps in a day. I actually started running so we started doing track twice a week which was two hours of a lot of output and I was severely under eating. I was probably eating one meal a day and supplementing honestly with coffee for the rest of the day, if I'm being completely honest, which is so unhealthy. It is so, so, so unhealthy. But at the beginning, I felt great. I was like, oh, I'm fasting. It's fantastic. I have so much energy. I'm losing weight. Everything feels good. I There was one evening we were actually at a cottage with a bunch of our friends and Ian looked at me and it was probably about 2 a.m. So we had been up all day and then we had been drinking that night and I was like eating chips or something at 2 a.m. And I was like, oh, I shouldn't be eating this. And Ian kind of looked at me and was like, yes, you should. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I don't really know like how to say this, but you're starting to look a little bit scary. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, your face is very sunken in. You almost look like you you do before you compete, like the night before a show, once you've like dehydrated and everything. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, I don't think so, but whatever. And I actually had a few other people in my life around that time asking if I was okay in terms of my eating habits and my body weight, I guess, my the, the loss of body weight. I did have people telling me and I kept kind of ignoring them and because I felt fine. I felt fine. I was still having a cycle. Everything was fine. And then all of a sudden it wasn't. And I actually lost my cycle and I started to have what kind of felt like some sort of like adrenal dysfunction or cortisol issues, something like that. I started not being able to sleep. I started to be very jittery throughout the day I actually stopped even having an appetite in general and the main thing that really really bothered me around that time was the loss of cycle because I obviously had decided to stop bodybuilding so I could rebalance hormones and make a baby and what I had done in the process was actually do the exact same thing as bodybuilding would do to me in terms of losing my cycle and my hormones not being balanced. 
I just did it with exercise and malnutrition. So that created a lot of shame, a lot of fear, a lot of guilt. And what happened after that is I pro- I started coping with all of those feelings by binge eating. And I kind of could rationalize the binge eating because I was supposed to be putting on weight. So who cares, right? <laughs> It turned into a cycle of binging and restricting and binging and restricting. And the weight came back slowly. And then it started, it kept coming. And then I'm trying to remember, I I had a very distorted view of my body. I had a very distorted view. I look back at photos now. I took photos all the time. I didn't post them, but I kept them in my camera roll. And I'm like, oh my God, I felt huge then. And... I wasn't at all. So we had a trip to Dubai and that was good. And then we came home and I'll be completely honest, before that trip for Dubai, I had a lot of anxiety about my body because I had obviously gained some weight. So probably for the two weeks before that trip for Dubai, I went right back into my old pattern of like severely under eating and over exercising. Now, while we were in Dubai, my cycle actually came back. So I was really happy about that. And then I got back home and I still am not really like addressing any issues, right? I'm just thinking that I'm going to put on body fat and my cycle's back and I, it's fine. I, I don't need to address my relationship with food or with eating and I don't need to really change anything health wise, what I'm eating, why I do this why I have these cycles of binging and uh, restricting, why I have so much of my self-worth tied to my body image, why I have so much shame when it comes to things like that. I'm not addressing any of that. The holidays come around and I I had now gained quite a bit of weight back and I wasn't binging so much as just kind of not eating healthy. I would kind of try to not eat all day and then I would go well, not crazy. I would go a little crazy at night and it was always sweets that I wanted to eat. So I wasn't really eating like nutrient dense food. I was eating chocolates. I was making protein oatmeal, protein mug cakes, lots of like just not nutrient dense food. Still drinking a lot of coffee during the day to kind of suppress my appetite. Now the holidays came around and I was really excited for these holidays. I was really, really looking forward to having Christopher and Courtney come down. I hadn't seen them in a long time. I was looking forward to being in my own home and having my family here and hosting. And I'm very proud of my home. I love cooking for people. The holidays make me so happy. I'm just like such a, I don't know. I love these like warm, cozy vibes. I love being around family. And I just really put a lot of expectation and not pressure because I don't really feel like that, especially with my family. I'm actually quite comfortable around my family, but I just had a, a lot of, I was looking forward to it a lot. The holidays were really hard for me. A lot of things that I think I've been suppressing for probably my whole life all kind of came flooding to the surface. There's been a lot of work that I've done over the last, I would say probably five years. I've seen a couple different therapists. I've kind of done a lot of, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I read a lot of books. There's a lot of things that I gravitate towards that make me feel seen and heard, but I don't know if I actually ever truly understood what was going on inside of me and I don't know I don't know if anyone knows about shadow work I don't know if I actually let myself see my shadow side my dark side parts of myself that I really don't like that show up that come out who I can be sometimes to others and to myself I I truly believe because I've been working with Jordan my new therapist since August of last year and we actually started seeing her as a couple to strengthen our marriage and it evolved into me seeing her solo and then I took a little bit of a break and then I started seeing her again at the end of last year 
And I truly think that my ability to kind of actually look in the mirror and see these parts of me that I haven't really acknowledged, it's all thanks to her. A lot of what I'm learning is accountability and compassion and having those two things at the same time. So holding myself accountable without the shame and without the guilt, it makes it a lot easier for me to look at these things that I do and how I show up and actually acknowledge them instead of pushing them down because we'll avoid shame at all costs. I think a lot of how I coped as a young teenager and as a teenager and a young woman was of the mindset that you only get help and connection and validation when you deserve it. And to deserve it, you have to be perfect. You have to be your best self. And if you're not your best self, then you don't deserve any of that stuff. And you need to work on yourself until you deserve it. And then you can ask for help. And then you can be seen. And then you can show up. And then you can connect and then you can get everything that you want. That is a really, really, really sad and lonely way to live. And I had convinced myself for a lot of my life that I was just an introverted, independent person and that I like to be alone and that I that I could do it on my own. It's very, very hard for me to ask for help. It's very, very hard for me to be honest at this stage in my healing to even know what I need to be able to ask for it. I don't even think that I take the time to feel what I'm feeling and to reflect on what I need to either give it to myself or to ask for help from others. But what I've realized over the last couple of weeks is that everybody deserves connection and everybody deserves to be seen and to be heard and to be loved and supported at every single stage of their lives and of who they are. And you don't need to show up a certain way to deserve that. This is not even just about relationships with other people. This is also relationship my, about my relationship with myself. And I think sometimes when I get in the shame spiral of taking care of myself and doing things that, uh, sorry, of not taking care of myself and not doing things that make me feel good, I feel guilty about that and then I keep going because now I don't feel like I even deserve those things in the first place. You don't give yourself what you don't believe deep down that you deserve. I'm starting to realize I thought for a long time that my healing was kind of going to be healed through healing my relationships with others. So making sure I have powerful and strong relationships with my family and with people around me, that's going to be my answer and my answer is actually healing the relationship with myself and learning to be more in tune with myself and know what I need and give that to myself and sometimes that will be asking for help and connection to others and sometimes that will be giving myself time to rest nourishing my body with healthy foods, doing a meditation, doing a workout, skipping a workout. That's one of my realizations. I tend to have some pretty, (laughs) I don't even know how to say it. Gross? I don't know. I tend to have some pretty nasty ways in which I show up when I don't feel great. And they don't, they aren't parts of me that like a lot of people see, but usually the people that do see them are the people closest to me. I'm doing this kind of like seminar workshop right now through my therapist, Jordan. And I'm starting to realize that these parts of myself that I don't really like, I have the power to change them. Before, it didn't really feel like that. It felt like I just had like reactions sometimes and I would just get stressed out and then I would snap and then I would say sorry and that's just how it has to be. But now I'm understanding that there's a way in which I heal my relationship with myself and my, I mean, really my little girl, my me as little girl, little Melissa, so I don't feel like that. So I do feel safe because I am and that I don't feel the need to attack or defend or protect. Just in recognizing the fact that these parts of me are something that I am able to change 
it's making it easier for me to look in the mirror and see those things and know that they're okay. And I also am having an easier time because I can acknowledge where those parts of me came from, that they're adaptive responses from coping as a young kid or what I saw as a young kid and how I don't have to be like that because that's not truly who I am, if that makes sense. So yeah, this is really just the beginning. I've had a lot of beautiful moments over the last couple of weeks, to be honest. A lot of really, I'm going to cry, a lot of really present moments, a lot of like really beautiful connection with my husband. I laughed last week in bed with him until I cried and I couldn't remember the last time I laughed that hard. I just, I used to think I had it figured out. I used to think like, fix the outside, make the outside pretty and then you'll feel good and then everything will be okay. Because if I feel good about the way I look, then everything's okay. And I'm starting to realize that that is not the route. I feel like what makes me feel good is being present and connected and alive. And it actually has nothing to do with how I look on the outside. So I'm very, I'm just very thankful. And I'm so happy that I have my marriage because I truly believe that my marriage is my path to healing. And I have such an amazing husband who pushes me and at the same time makes me feel so safe. And I think that's so important to have that secure attachment with your person. And I'm just so, 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 so grateful. Listen, I'm, I still have moments. I still like look in the mirror when I'm changing and I'm like, holy shit, what did you do? Like, how did you let your body go this far away from what you were two, three months ago? I still have these moments of like, I don't want to go to the gym because I don't want people to see how much weight I've gained. And I don't want people to ask me if I'm pregnant when I'm not. All these things are still there, but they don't feel as detrimental to my self-worth, to how I see myself. I'm still able to let myself be seen and be vulnerable with the people that I know are safe because I know I deserve it. So that's that on that. I'm sure as I continue to learn and grow, we'll be on this journey together. But I just, I hope that this resonates with anybody. And I know that it's scary sometimes. And I know it can feel so dark and so alone. And it feels like you're going to feel like that forever but you don't have to. Okay. So now where are we today? Let's make a baby. (laughs) I am working. I shared a little bit last week. I think now because I'm out of the shame and into acceptance and just seeing myself as I am and seeing my situation for what it is and feeling a little bit empowered in terms of my decisions and my choices and that I get to choose, I am able to look at my kind of fertility situation a little bit different. And because of that, I'm asking for help and I'm reaching out and I'm finding resources. And two weeks ago, I actually asked Courtney who she was working with. I saw her post someone on her story and the company is called Kale Diagnostics. I think it was founded by a woman named Courtney. So I reached out to them and I got on a call with them And I kind of explained my situation from beginning to end where I was. I was very open with them and we're now looking into what's going on inside. So we're doing some testing. We're going to do a Dutch test eventually. I don't think that's my first round of testing to look at hormones, cortisol. I think that's all it does. First round of testing is going to be, oh my God, some sort of hair test which I believe is to test for mineral deficiencies. And then I'm also doing a stool sample to test my GI health. So we're going to do that. I am currently, I, I still don't have a regular cycle. I do track my ovulation. Last month I did not ovulate. I actually had an ultrasound on Monday at the fertility clinic. And that was to make sure that my fallopian tubes were not blocked. So I know I've talked about this on the podcast before because one of you actually reached out to me about the procedure. But what it is, is they put, I mean, it's kind of like a pap and then they put a tube in your cervix 
and then they actually blow up a little balloon to create space. And what they do is they're trying to flush saline, I believe it is, through your tubes to see if they're clear because that's where the egg drops from. So if the tubes aren't clear, it could be from damage, malformation, scar tissue. Um, I don't know if like cysts or anything. I, I'm not sure. But anyways, I did that test. It was... It was uncomfortable, but honestly, it was really short, so it wasn't that bad. It just felt like a little bit crampy at certain points, and I found out, I actually already knew, but my uterus is, I think they call it retroverted, so it's backwards. So at one point, I kind of had to like roll onto my side while I had this like tube up my, mm -hmm, and that was probably the most uncomfortable part, and then there was a lot of cramping then, and then... I think it's because there were air bubbles or something. So I had to like move for the air bubbles to like escape. So the the liquid would go through the tube. This is so weird, but it's, I find it fascinating. And then it was over and everything was good. And she actually said she could see a follicle developing on the right. So that's a really good sign. I'm really hoping that I do ovulate this month. And that's where I'm at with my fertility. Now, as we know, it takes two to make a baby. And Ian, halfway through his season last year, actually decided to retire as well. So as soon as he started to retire, we both felt very aligned that it was time to start trying. And he actually immediately got on an HCG, HMG protocol and that is because for those of you that don't know, men that take, I don't know, steroid, des designer steroids, exogenous testosterone, anything like that are at a very high risk of a decreased sperm count and that you don't have to be a bodybuilder for that to be true. You can even, I'm sure there are a lot of men out there that just use this recreationally, but it does affect your sperm count. Now, it's different for everybody. Obviously, my brother and Courtney got pregnant while he was getting ready for the Olympia. But you are kind of rolling the dice with that as a man. But it is also something that is a lot easier usually to fix than women. <laughs> so they use drugs called HCG or peptides. I don't know what the fuck they are. HCG, HMG. I think sometimes there's Clomid put in there to help sperm count. So after Ian, no, Ian was still competing actually when he did his first semen analysis and his sperm count was low. It wasn't great, but he was also four weeks out from a show. So we didn't expect it to be great. And then as soon as he retired, he started his protocol. So he's been on that since I think August of last year. He goes back in, it's supposed to be next week, but I think we're going to push it because we're going away this weekend. And I think he's planning on partying and he doesn't want to do his test after partying, which I respect. So we're going to push that another week and he's going to redo that and see where he's at. And hopefully his numbers are good. If not, there will probably have to be a little bit more intervention there. I know sometimes even men that are on a TRT dose have to stop the testosterone completely to bring their sperm count back up. So we'll see where that's at. And I asked him if this was kosher to talk about because this is private. But again, first of all, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Second of all, it doesn't have to be uncomfortable talking about it. And third of all, I think he's very cognizant of the fact that this could help some people and that there are a lot of men that might have gone through something like this. Yeah, so he's aware. One day I'll bring him on and we can talk about this on here together, maybe when all our results are wrapped up. So after the fertility clinic gets all the testing that they need, my last test was that ultrasound. And then his last test will be this new analysis. We actually sit down with the doctor and we discuss next steps, whether that is IVF or IUI or 
if we have to do some sort of intervention to get me ovulating again, which I, I'm, I'm still not there yet. I can't lie. I do think working with Maddie, my nurse practitioner at Kale Diagnostics, we can do it in a more natural way by fixing lifestyle things, which I guess will lead me into what I'm doing right now to kind of optimize my fertility and my chances to have a regular cycle and balance my hormones. I've stopped drinking coffee, which I thought was going to be so much harder than it is. And it really is not that hard at all. I thought it was going to be impossible. It's winter here and I'm like, I love hot drinks, but I also, I can drink peppermint tea. I have like a, a, a cocoa uh, drink that I drink. I still am drinking matcha, which has a little bit of caffeine in it. But I only have one a day, which is safe. You can even drink that when you're pregnant at uh, that caffeine dose. And I'm working on balancing my blood sugar. So I think because for such a long time, I was like drinking coffee with oat milk and sweetener. And then I was like not eating all day. And then I was kind of having like sweet sugary things at night. It really wasn't great for my blood sugar levels, which is highly correlated with um, female hormone levels. So I am now eating breakfast every day, just protein and fats. I'm not having any carbs. And then I'm eating three meals a day. I feel so much better. I feel more energized. I feel less inflamed. I feel like I'm sleeping better. I do have a little bit of worry that I have some sort of adrenal fatigue from what I've been doing for the last couple of months because there was just a marker on my blood work and I also find myself kind of waking up in the middle of the night sometimes and I'm like wide awake, which is a sign of like a cortisol dysfunction. That I'm sure we might see. I, this is just a guess based on symptoms. This isn't based on anything else. So we'll see that when we do the Dutch test. I think I've talked enough by myself. I just want to say that you don't have to go at life alone. It's not noble it's not it doesn't make you more powerful or safer and you are deserving of support and help and love and to be seen and to be connected and I know sometimes our wounds can convince us otherwise but you don't have to go at it alone you really don't so with that being said I hope I'm not alone on this podcast next week Courtney I think moves I mean she's honestly moving out of our Florida rental and I feel awful she's moving everything I think Christopher was in Brazil and she's been doing it all by herself with her mom and she's fucking like I mean she must be six and a half months pregnant seven months pregnant so like she's a fucking angel but hopefully she's back next week and we can catch up with her how her pregnancy is going she is literally glowing like this this woman is not real you see her and you're like, how are you the perfect pregnant being? And she almost seems happier and more at peace, pregnant than not pregnant, which is like such a beautiful thing to see and a very inspiring thing to see as someone who hopes to be pregnant soon. So looking forward to having her back next week and seeing you guys then. Thank you so much for being here and continuing to support the Giver podcast. We love you guys so much. Have a badass week and we'll see you next Friday. Bye.